everybody. Here we go. It is a Wednesday morning. You hear the sounds. You hear the song. Time now for your Berkshire Hathaway bi-weekly podcast. Realty expert John Brodine is standing by, and we're going to talk with him right after this. Look, if you want that home, let's go get you that home. And it's okay to feel a little nervous or to not know what to look for. Because our network agents have the expertise to take the scary out of buying a home. Well, most of it. Now, let's go get you home. All right, and we are back. John Brodine, how are you, buddy? Hey, I'm good. Good. How'd your Thanksgiving go? It was awesome. Get yeah. enough to eat? Yeah, oh, more than enough. You Probably know, I, I know you're a, a kind of a health guy. Uh, do you do you take that day off of, of eating right oh, and, yeah. and just let her all go right into the can on I Thanksgiving? I, I eat healthy like all all the weekdays, mm-hmm. and then on the weekends I basically both uh, both nights cheat meal nights. Yep, yep. That's, that's the way I do it. Keeps me sane. Yeah. Do you give yourself a cheat night every week? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Like okay. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. Oh okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the what other the days ate nice and clean. Mm-hmm. So balances um, it out. Is there is there a go to a must on Thanksgiving for John Brody? Oh, Something man. you gotta eat. I love the scalp corn and the oh, yeah. bread dressing. Yeah. <laughs> those are my favorites. Yeah. Uh, I gotta admit, those are probably two of mine too. Yeah. You know, we've been doing these uh, bi-weekly podcasts for a while now. Uh, we know we have people tuning in and watching and viewing, but. Um, do you get a lot of questions yeah. from viewers and, and, and just people in general? I do. And so this week, I specifically kind of asked for some questions okay. uh, on social media, and we got some really good questions to cover here. Okay. Um, so the first question, my buddy Devin, uh, he asked, can real estate investing be a viable option for people with other full-time jobs? So yes, 100%. Pretty much every real estate investor that I know, unless they inherited a ton of money or something like that, um, has started with a full-time job. And they usually live well, well below their means Mm -hmm. and and they're able to save up a ton of money and um, they build up their portfolio until they are able to sustain themselves without working their job anymore. And some people decide to keep their job, um, you know, especially if it's a job they really like and other people, they decide to leave their job completely and be a full time real estate investor. Oh, okay. So rental properties is a lot of people. That's what they do. Yeah. almost every pretty much everybody i know started with a full-time job Mm -hmm. yeah now uh you are one of these investors aren't you yes yeah Yeah. and uh you have a full-time job are you ever gonna quit working um not for quite a while i really like what i do sure you know right now i have five units and i'd probably have to get up to like you know more than 25 units oh wow um to you know replace my income Mm -hmm. um or enough to sustain myself you know um but the nice thing, like, so that'd be to like retire early. Yep, um, yep. The nice thing is when you have these things on like, you know, 30 year loans or 20 year loans or whatever, you know, there will come a point as you get older where they start being paid off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at that point, you can probably expect, expect your rental cash flow to like double. Um, sure. So, I mean, as a retirement plan, but ra- but quitting your job and kind of retiring early and being a full-time real estate investor, you do need, you need a lot of rental units to be able to pull mm-hmm. that off. You know, it's funny uh, that you say, well, I really like my job. Um, I don't think there's a realty expert at Berkshire Hathaway that doesn't <laughs> like their That's job. True. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? So, um, Khaleesi, I hope I said, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, he said, please discuss a strategy to prepare for investment property acquisition following a primary residence purchase. Basically, he's asking if I just bought a home that I'm living in, how do I prepare myself to buy my first investment property? And, and that's a really good question. Um, and it's, it's a little bit more complicated of a question than the first one. So um, basically, uh, the biggest hurdle for your average person who just bought a home is going to be the down payment. When, mm-hmm. you, when you buy your primary residence, you can use as little as a 3% down loan. If you're a veteran or if it's USDA, you can do 0% down. When you're buying your first investment property using an investment property loan, if you're buying a single family home, you need to put 20% down. If you're buying anything from like two to four units, you need to put 25% down. Okay. okay? So that's a big hurdle for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of cash to save up. Um, so the first thing I'd tell you to do is live well beneath your means. Um, keep your savings rate really high. Like the larger your after-tax monthly income and after you subtract your expenses, if you could keep your expenses as low as possible, like 
people who are really killing it are spe- like they're living off of about 50 percent of their income mm-hmm. and you can see how you can amass a, a pretty big savings pretty quickly sure. if you're doing that um if you're if you're a little strapped right now um and you feel like you need to make some sacrifices to reach these goals uh some of the things you could think about doing would be like if you're if your home's in an R2 neighborhood, finding a way to maybe convert it into a duplex, like turn the basement oh. into a basement apartment, mm-hmm. works especially well if you have one of those like 60s ranches yep. that has a side door. Um, usually they're like a thousand square feet up and a thousand square feet down. If it's got a side door um, to the uh, side door to the driveway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, usually the steps down to the basement go right, right down right inside that side door. Yep. I don't know what type of house he's in. But uh, if you can build a wall and then put a door there with a deadbolt lock that makes it so the basement person has their separate entrance, Mm -hmm. that's one of the easy ways to convert a primary residence into a duplex. Now, the other thing that he could consider if his home, so it's not going to really be realistic if if he's got like a $250,000 or $300,000 house just because the rents on a home like that typically aren't enough to cash flow very well sure, uh, or cash flow at all in Grand Forks. But if he's got a home that's under 170,000, under 200,000, or if he could convert his home right now into a duplex and rent it out as two separate units, of course it would have to be in an R2 neighborhood, uh, zoning wise. Mm-hmm. Um, he could he could keep his primary residence that he's got now, turn it into a rental property, and then buy a different primary residence to live in. That way he could uh, acquire a, a new property to live in and basically put like 3% down on the new property and then turn his old place into a rental. Um, in order to do that, you would probably need to get a lease signed. And the bank's going to be able to use like 75% of that rental income to offset the monthly payment on your current primary residence so that you can qualify for the loan on the new one. Um, now, when you're buying a rental property and you're going to stay in your primary residence, um, the way the bank you know, the way the bank looks at the payment on that property is they're going to uh, do an appraisal on the new property that you're buying, the investment property. And if there's not a lease in place right now with a tenant, if there is a lease in place, they're going to use 75% of that rental income to offset the payment. Um, so the debt to income probably shouldn't be an issue for you as long as you're buying a home that cash flows, the buying a rental that cash flows. If it's not leased out right now and it's vacant, you're going to turn it into a rental. They're going to do a market rents appraisal when they do the appraiser on the uh, appraisal on the property. And then you'll be able to use 75% of those market rents to offset the payment. So it's not going to hurt your, you know, so it's not going to count against your debt to income mm-hmm. ratio. And I, uh, I, I will admit I cheated a little bit. This sounds like I'm talking mortgage talk. I did call up a lender yesterday. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I ran this buyer to make sure that I'm given the right information. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. He really is smart. Yeah. Um, now, say you, uh, John, had one of these ranch houses like you're talking about, and you want to convert the basement into a rentable apartment. What all needs to be done? I mean, uh, depending on bedrooms, uh, you're talking egress windows, things like that. But uh, what all, and, and is there a lot to do to make it into a rentable income property, your, the, the basement of your house? I mean, it could be as simple as just uh, renting out a room in your basement. Mm-hmm. You know, you can do that. Um, that's a way to generate some income. A more permanent option is converting it into a duplex. To convert it into a duplex, you know, you're going to have to uh, build a wall and add a door to, to make a separate entrance for the basement apartment person. You're probably going to need a common area or else you're going to need to add washer and dryer upstairs oh. so that both tenants can use a washer and dryer. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I'd highly recommend is uh, getting the electrical separately metered. Sure. And maybe adding yep. some electric baseboard heaters that the basement tenant uses to heat their property. So they've got their electrical bill that covers their heat and electricity. And then the upstairs tenant has their own electrical bill. Uh, that covers the gas for the furnace, which is used to heat their property and then their electric usage. Um, what you can do is just add a second electrical panel, make sure all the basement is on one panel, mm-hmm. make sure the upstairs is on another panel, and then have the electrician install a second meter socket and then have XL Energy come in and install an electrical meter. Um, of course, you're going to have to add you know, a kitchen down there. Yep. Uh, if it doesn't have a bathroom already, you know, if the basement's finished, you're main, mainly just going to have to add a ki- uh, kitchen down mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Having little two plumbing bedrooms, work. Yeah, a little, little plumbing work. Having two bedrooms is much better than having one for right. rental purposes, too. And okay. You need egress windows if you're adding a, a second bedroom. Okay. Uh, I put an egress window in my house, did it myself okay. uh, with the help of a good friend of mine. Um, not the easiest thing to do, but not that hard to do either. Not that hard to do. You know, either. depending on if you got a block basement or a concrete basement, or I guess there's still some wood foundations out there too. Yeah. And to hire that out probably costs about three grand. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're hiring out, adding a second 
a second electrical panel and a second second meter socket. It's probably also going to be about two grand. Mm -hmm. um, I had to do that on one of my duplexes. Okay, um, that's what it ran me. So yeah. Okay. But you know, if you're if you're not able to have a great savings rate, so you're like, how am I going to get that down payment? This is one of the ways that you could do it, um, because you know you rent out a basement apartment for seven hundred bucks a month, mm -hmm. and you cut your mortgage payment down quite a bit and decrease your living expenses, so you're able to save more each month. Okay, you know that's a good idea because uh, maybe I could do something like that and knock a little off the rent if they mow, move snow. There you go. There you go. <laughs> all that stuff because exactly. it seems like that's all I do. <laughs> yeah. Figure out how much you'd have to knock off the rent and see yeah. if it's better just to hire it out or to have them do it. Well, I got, got a, a nice yard. So. Yeah, and I, I have a really nice rider and I have a nice four wheeler with a blade on it and all that stuff. So it's not that tough to do. But yeah. um, you always come so prepared, uh, John. A any other questions from any of the viewers? Yeah, so there was a, a question from Andrea. She asked, Do you feel that uh, short inventory will continue into 2022? So there's no way to know for sure. Um, if interest rates go up substantially, like if interest rates, let's say, hit four, mm -hmm. um, that could potentially decrease demand because it decreases buyer's uh, purchasing power. So you could see if that potentially decreases demand. But I did take a look before I came here today. And in the years before, the interest rates really dropped off. So if you look at like 2015 to 2019, before the interest rates got really low, year after year, there were more homes sold in Grand Forks every single year. Um, and the inventory has really dropped off and that really doesn't show much sign of slowing down. Um, like this month inventory dropped and it's normal for inventory to drop in the winter because fewer people are listing their homes sure. this time of year. Um, but normally, you know, in the past few months, you've seen 70 to 80 on a normal month, new listings hit the market. Uh, in November, we only saw 40. We're down to like 141 listings on the market right now. So, um, Going into winter, we're, we're actually lower uh, active listings than we were last November. Oh, um, okay. So I don't really see the lack of inventory going down much. Um, you know, and I, I don't see any reason why a ton more listings would hit the market. Um, but there's no way to know for sure. Uh, you know, there's a few factors that could influence it. But, you know, personally, I see things kind of keeping on going the way they're going. Okay. Uh, got anything else? No, that's all three of the questions that uh, I wanted to cover from social media. So um, yeah, thank you to Devin, Khaleesi, and Andrea for asking those questions. And, okay, that, that uh, is a, a mouthful, that questions. name. <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. I've been friends with them on Facebook for a while, so I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Okay. <laughs> um, man, it's great to have you back in the studio. Yes, yes uh, good to be here. Any plans? Well, we're going to be hooking up again on Friday. Yes, I'll see you on Friday. Okay, so. you going to give me a hint to what we're going to talk about? Or are you going to surprise me? Uh, I think I've got some more social media questions that oh, we're going to cover. So, all right. Looking yeah. forward to it. Absolutely. All right. And uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of realty expert John Brodine, how do they do that? Yeah, reach out to me. My cell phone 701-213-5428. You can follow me on Instagram, John Brodine Realtor. You can follow me on YouTube. You can follow me on Facebook. I post a lot of content on all the social media platforms. All right. There you go. Realty expert John Brodine, your Berkshire Hathaway bi-weekly podcast. And I tell you what, if you're going to buy or sell through John Brodine, and you need a little work done in that house, get a hold of Executive Properties. Now, we've been talking a lot about Executive and doing snow removal. Now, if you've been heeing and hawing about uh, hiring somebody to do snow removal, I'm guessing you got a wake-up call this morning. Get a hold of Executive Properties. They'll do it for you. 701-330-1273 or go to executiveproperties.org. Until Friday, there is your Berkshire Hathaway bi-weekly podcast. <laughs>